Hey, thank you so much for joining our webinar. You know, one of the 613 laws is after the Jewish people conquered the land of Israel and settled the land, there was a mitzvah, an agricultural law. Every landowner had to bring the first fruits to Yerushalayim and offer it as a thank you to Hashem. Now, when we learn this on a simple level, it's an agricultural law. But on a deeper level, it has a completely different meaning. But to share the Kabbalistic insight with us this evening, once again, is Rabbi Dubov, a Kabbalistic expert who is going to take us on the most amazing journey. So please, over to you, Rabbi Dubov, and thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Masinta. I'm always put in a good mood by your jingle, your introductory uh, jingle, uh, which today is Kol Hanashama Tehalel Ka Haleluka, which is the last verse in the book of Tehillim. And there's a beautiful midrash on that verse, which says the word neshama, of course, which means the soul, comes from the word neshima, which means breathing. And the midrash says, al kol neshima uneshima tahalalka halaluka. On every breath, give thanks to God. Anybody who's been on an asthmatic ward, or God forbid, a COVID ward, knows how precious a breath is. And for every breath, we need to give thanks to God. Giving thanks is a foundation and a principle of our faith. But nowhere do we see it more demonstrable than in the mitzvah of bikurim, of bringing first fruits, like you just mentioned. Because not only do we verbalize our thanks, but in fact, the mitzvah of bikurim is that when the farmer sees his very first fruits, which are growing in the field and on the tree, he marks them and eventually brings them to the temple in a beautiful procession. Let's just have a look at the verses in this week's parsha. Let's also have a look at a few halachot in the Rambam, in Maimonides, and then let's venture deeper into a Kabbalistic insight. So actually today's share is going to go, if you want, step by step, deeper and deeper into the omek, into the depth of this subject. And it will finish off with a most beautiful story and lesson, which is very, very appropriate for the time in which we are currently. Vahaya ki savai el this week's parasha. When you will come into the land which the Almighty is going to give you as an inheritance, for your rishta, for your shabta, but you'll dwell in it, what should you do? Take the first fruits, which you'll bring from the land which the Lord is going to give you, put it in a basket, Go to the place which the Lord your God chooses to have his Shekhinah, have his divine presence rest there. Come to the Kohen who was in those days, say to him, I've done everything <clears throat> I've, I've um, I brought to you these first fruits. The Kohen should take them, he should wave them, and then you should say a whole formula um, of Pesukim, which is mentioned in this week's Sedra, going back to the very genesis of our people and the exodus of Egypt, how we're crying out to Hashem, Hashem heard us, he extracted us from Egypt, he brought us to this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and therefore I've come, I'm depositing these fruits here before you today, prostrating and rejoicing in all the good that you have bestowed upon us. What a beautiful, beautiful way to thank Hashem. And the Rambam, Maimonides, has an entire section of halachas called Hilchas Bikurim, the laws of Bikurim. In the second chapter, he writes, it is a positive commandment to bring Bikurim, the first fruits to the Beis Amikdash. That was only done in the time of the Beis Amikdash and in the land of Israel. And one only brings Bikurim from the seven fruits which the land of Israel is praised with, which are wheat, barley, grapes, dates, 
pomegranates, olives, and figs. And one also only brings from the choicest of these fruits. One doesn't bring them as they are in the liquid form, apart from <clears throat> olives and grapes. And those who bring from close to Yerushalayim should bring figs and grapes, which are fresh. Those who are distant, one should bring them in the form of raisins. And of course, there's a time period when you can actually bring these Bikurim. One doesn't bring them before Shavuot, and one only brings them until uh, Sukkot and until Hanukkah. There are sort of time limits as when you can bring, when you can do the reading, and so on and so forth. And they must actually be brought, as the Rambam says in the third chapter, in a basket. And the Rambam discusses what types of baskets <clears throat> rich people used to bring them in, baskets of which were uh, made of, of metals, precious metals. And of course, those were taken back. Others brought them in simple. The poor people used to bring them in simple uh, baskets, which were made of reeds. And those were actually left in the Beis Amikdash with the Koyin. And the Rambam goes on to describe to us the beautiful, beautiful procession of how somebody who was bringing Bikurim would be met by the Kohanim and they would sing tremendous songs of praise to Hashem and eventually deposit their first fruits inside the temple. Beautiful. What a beautiful way of saying thank you to Hashem for giving us that bounty. <clears throat> How do we do the mitzvah today? Torah is eternal. Today, until Mashiach comes and rebuilds the temple, which we hope will be very soon, but every mitzvah has its eternal dimension. At this moment, being in Galut, how do we perform the mitzvah of Bikurim today? What is the esoteric dimension of Bikurim? So I'm now going to go a little deeper. We're going to walk into the world of the Midrash. And I'm going to quote to you a whole load of different Midrashim, and then we'll venture a little deeper and give the esoteric dimension, which will unravel and sew together all the Midrashim, which we're about to learn now. Let's start off with a Midrash called the Midrash Kanchuma on this week's parasha. The Medrash says, Safa Moshe Baruach HaKodesh. Moshe looked with his divine spirit. He saw that the temple would eventually be destroyed. And we would bring first fruits no more. For his skin, Israel, so he instituted for the Jewish people, that they should pray three times a day. And this would be in the place of the Bikurim, in the place of the first fruits. How do you understand that? Well, simply, one may understand it, that bringing Bikurim is an act of thanksgiving, and perhaps three times a day, we should recognize the bounty, the kindness, the tremendous benevolence that God bestows upon us, and hence perform the mitzvah of Bikurim in some form during the three daily prayers. There is a saper called the Megala Amukas. He asked the question, what is this connection between Bikurim and prayer? And furthermore, the Talmud says that the reason the sages instituted daily prayer was parallel to the daily sacrifice in the temple. Shacharis, parallel to the Tomid Shoshacha, the continual sacrifice in the morning, 
And Mincha, the afternoon, parallel to the Tomer Shobain or Abayim, the daily sacrifice in the afternoon. Also, it says, the Avos, the patriarchs, instituted the three daily prayers. Avraham, Davin Shacharis, Yitzchak prayed Mincha, and Yaakov prayed Marib. But what's the connection with Bikurim? There's a posuk in Hosea. Hosea was one of the minor prophets. Chapter 9, verse 10, where he writes the following. Ka'anovim bamidbar matzasa Yisrael kavikura bite'ena. I found Israel like grapes in the desert, like a ripe fruit on a fig tree. In its beginning did I view your father, your fathers, Bereshisa Raisi Avoisechem. This Pasuk means that the Avois, the forefathers of the fathers of our people, Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, are paralleled to Bikurim. And in fact, the Midrash says that quite clearly, that Bikurim, the first root, referred to the fathers. And in fact, it says that the fathers were going to be created before the world was created, and hence, they are the first root. Well, we can start hearing already the parallel between the Ovois, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Shacharis, Mincha, and Mariv, and Bikurim, and first roots, because the patriarchs are like first roots. The Zohar says the following. The Zohar says that the Jewish people are called Bikurim. And it brings a verse, this verse in Hosea, Kibikura Bitaena Reshisa. And then it quotes a verse in Jeremiah in Yirmiya, chapter 2, verse 3. Kodesh Yisrael Hashem, Reshis Tabuasim. Israel is holy to God, the first of his crop. In other words, that the Jewish people are called Bikurim are called the first fruits. So now we have in the Midrash calling the patriarchs first fruits, Bikurim. The Zohar calls the Jewish people Bikurim. There's another Midrash in Bereshus that says, Machshavtan shall Yisrael kodma l'choldova. The thought of the Jewish people came before everything. And Rashi, in his commentary on Chumash, at the very beginning of the five books of Moses, the very first verse, Bereshes bara elokim asa shamayim in the beginning God created heaven and earth, Rashi says that the word Bereshes is base Rashis. Base two racist beginnings. There are two things that are called racist. The first thing that is called racist is the Jewish people. As it says in Jeremiah, Kodesh Yisrael Hashem racist to Buasa. They are the first of his crop. And another thing which is called racist is the Torah. And therefore, the world was created for Israel, for the Jewish people, and for the Torah. Base, racist, for these two things which are called racist, Baralakim, as a Shemaim, as a Oretz, God created the heaven and the earth. One final midrash before we put all these midrashim together. It's a quite a, a, a fascinating midrash in the book of Ruth. A midrash in Ruth. The midrash says, "Be mi nimlach." 
with whom did God confer before he created the world? In other words, he discussed it with the committee. There was a board meeting. And who was sitting at this board meeting? Nishmeseyem shal tzadikim, the souls of the righteous. So what is your view on this creation? Yes, go ahead, do it. What does this mean? What does it mean that the patriarchs are called Bikurim? The Jewish people are called Bikurim? The thought of the Jewish people came first. There are two firsts, Torah and Yisrael. And in fact, Yisrael, all of the Mashava, Israel came in, in thought even before the Torah. And with whom did God confer to create the world? With the souls of the righteous. All quotes from the Midrash. Let's now put it all together. Much has been written about the purpose of creation. Why did God create the world? If you have a look right throughout <clears throat> Jewish literature, whoa, huge amount has been written as the purpose of creation. Some say that the purpose is, is because Teva HaToyv Lehetiv God is good. It's the nature of a good being to do good, to bestow goodness, and so he created the world. In other writings, it's written that God wished to reveal the ultimate powers and capabilities which he has, and so on and so forth. Today, we're going to dwell upon the reason presented in Midrash Tanfuma Parshas Nosoi, explained in Tanya chapter 36. And the Midrash says, the reason, the ultimate reason why God created the world is Nisava HaKodesh Baruch Hu, because God desired Lias Lo Yizborach Dira Batachpeni. God wanted to have a dwelling, a Dira. In Israel, in the palm, it's called a Dira. Batachtoinim in the Olam HaTachtoin, in the lowest of all worlds, in the Tachtoin She'ein Tachtoin Lamata Mimen, in the Tachtoin, the lowest world, which there is no lower world in terms of concealment. In other words, this world is the world of greatest concealment. This is where God wanted to have a dwelling. Today is the 11th of Elo, the anniversary of the marriage of the Rebbe Rashab. In a few days' time, on the 15th of Elo, it was the day that he founded his yeshiva called Tonchet Mimim, which was a special yeshiva, the fifth Rebbe of Lubavitch, a special yeshiva in which students would learn a Torah Tamima, a complete Torah, both the revealed aspects of the Torah, Nigla, and also the esoteric aspects, Siddhas. In fact, they had a daily study schedule of 12 hours a day, two hours in the morning they'd learn Siddhas, then they'd learn eight hours of the revealed part of the Torah and another two hours of Siddhas at night. In the Chassidus of the Rebbe Rasham. This idea that God wanted to create a Dira B'tachtoinim is discussed at great length, especially in his book called Sefer HaMa'amorim Tov Reish Samach Vav in the very first discourse. And the key is that there are two elements to this desire. The first is, Hashem wanted a dwelling for his essence, for Atmos, for his very essence. And whom did he wish to effect 
that dwelling, the Tachtoinim, meaning it must be done begidre hatachtoinim in the parameters of people who live in this world. In other words, with whom did God entrust the mission to reveal the very essence of God in this world? It was and is the creations of this world, you and me. Within our parameters of time, space, and so on. So, in fact, the Alter Rebbe writes in Tanya, all the supernal realms, and of course, Kabbalah maps that out in an anatomical way, however high and supernal they are, the lower garden of Eden, the higher garden of Eden, the world of Atzilus, the world of Kassa, the world of Odom Kadman, Oyer and Sof, Simson, all those worlds, are, in the words of the Alter Rebbe, a Yurida, a descent from the Godhead, from the essence of godliness. In terms of revelation, they're magnificent, but in terms of ultimate purpose, they're a descent. They are there in, to inspire us here in this world, but the ultimate purpose, the reason why God created this material, physical world, it's that we as human beings within this world should create this dwelling within the confines and parameters of our modus operandi. How do we do that? God sent down to this world souls, nishans. Originally, those souls were basking in the original divine light. And we're one, if you want, with godliness. God, however, created or detached, if we could possibly say such a thing, a spark of that godliness into a form of creation, which comes down seemingly as an independent existence within a body. And the body, of course, being corporeal and materialistic, confines, conceals, opaques the pristine nature of the soul. But yet, it is that candle that can illuminate the body and the world around with the power of Torah. Because Torah is called Ois. And what happened was that God sent Torah down to this world. He gave the Torah to us as the instrument through which the soul within the body can connect to the divine. The Zohar says it in the following way. There are three bonds. There is God, Torah, and Israel, and Israel connects to God through Torah. The truth is that the thought of Israel preceded Torah, and therefore the Talmud says that if a Jew strays, transgresses Torah, they're still a Jew, because essentially they have a soul. But as the Rambam says, the true inner will of a Jew is in fact to keep the Torah, which is divine wisdom and will itself. Now, let's transpose all of what we've said into the subject of Bikuri. Think of it this way. You are composite of body and soul. What is the first fruits? What is the prime element? the beginning within you. It's the soul. That was, is, will be. It existed before you were born. 
it exists within your body and it will continue to exist once the body goes to the grave. The body came from the earth and goes back to the earth. But the soul is eternal because it's a veritable spark of godliness. The purpose of the descent of the soul, as we said beforehand, was not for the soul itself. It was to create this dwelling for God down here in this world. So the very first thing that a person has to do in order to fulfill their soul descent is to recognize the source and the root of the soul. Because if a person doesn't realize that they have a pristine spark of godliness within them, and if a person completely rejects and opaques that, then what takes over within them is their animal crass nature. So the first thing we need to do is to bring Bikuri. We need to recognize those first roots, the patriarchs, the souls that pre-existed creation. We need to bring that to the temple. We need to place that before God. And we need to realize within ourselves what the Mishnah says in Kiddushin, I am only created to serve my master. I'm a first fruit. I have a mission from the very beginning. In Genesis, I was created in order to descend and to fulfill the purpose in creation. Now, if we wanted to talk about that in terms of what we would call avoider, our service of Hashem, we could talk about what's called bringing up our first, our first fruits to Hashem. And when we work from below, we have to extract, take the first bits and fruits and bring them to the holy temple. We need to bring them to the Kohen, who is there? The Talmud in Menachas, page 110a, and echoed in the Zohar, says it's in this way there is an angel called Michael, Michael, who is the Kahana Rabba, the great Kohen, who sacrifices the souls of the Jewish people on the altar. It's a cryptic way of saying that the souls are elevated to become cognizant of their source. That's called halo milamata lamaila, rising from below to above. And that's the idea of bringing the Bikurim to the temple. But when we're there, we actually read this whole formula that's the idea of bringing down from above the dvash, the holy, sweet, eretz, zovas, chal of the dvash, the land flowing with milk and honey, the sweetness and pleasure to bask in divine cognizance, perception, direction, fulfillment of mission and purpose. Do you get the connection between Bikurim and prayer now? Because that's exactly what prayer is. In prayer, you have the movement from below to above, especially in the reading of the Shema. When we say, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, meaning with both your Yetzir Tov and your Yetzir Hara with all your nefesh, with all your soul, even if it takes your soul, with your thought, speech, and action, with all your money, 
with all your resource and with everything you've got. That's a movement from below. That's like bringing the Bikurim. And then you've got the Amida, which is the bringing down from above the blessing. The recognition, once you've reached that place, that for some Tobatana, you need to place that recognition and aspiration in a basket and bring it down. In fact, if you have a look in the continuation of the parasha, the parasha says that after you've done all that, after God tells us the mitzvah of Bikurim, he says, Hayoim hazeh, Moshe Rabbeinu addresses the Jewish people and says, today God is commanding you to keep the statutes and the laws, and you should keep them with all your soul and all your heart. And Hashem has distinguished you to be to, today as a God for him and you as a people for him, an Am Segula, a treasured nation, etc. cetera. It's very beautiful words. This is the covenant that God makes with the Jewish people just before they enter the land. In addition to the covenant that he made with them at Sinai, they are now, just before they're going into the land, they need to have another covenant with God. Spiritually, the land which we're going into, that's the land of recognition of mission. For that, you need a circumcision. The circumcision is the removal of the foreskin. The spiritual foreskin is the immersion in the quagmire of the desires, vanities, and engagement with the pleasures of the world, which serve no purpose, are temporal, and are fleeting. That doesn't mean to say that Judaism rejects pleasure, but it embraces it and elevates it and gives it divine purpose. So let's summarize what we've said till now. A Jew must bring Bikurim. A Jew must recognize that there's a mission over here. There's a first fruit. There's something which you have to bring to the temple and place there. There's something in your every day that you need to recognize that you have an ashrama that came down to this world for a purpose in a certain time frame. And you need to deliver your first fruits to God. First fruits of every day, the very moment that you open your eyes, as soon as you wake up in the morning, we say, we put our hands together, bow our heads slightly, and say, the formula which is such a beautiful formula, thanks to God for returning our souls, and an expression of our great belief in and faith in, in him and him in us. And then throughout the day, we continue with our thanksgiving and yet our recognition that with tremendous merit comes responsibility. And so when we engage in commerce, our first fruits are given to God, Sadaka. The optimum times of a person's mental <clears throat> Um, awareness and capabilities are given to learning. So whenever a person is most awake, most alert, that's the time that we give to Torah learning. And any other form of resource that you have, whether it be mental, intellectual, spiritual, emotional, physical, talent, whatever you have, the first fruits always go to Hashem. That's the mitzvah. And that's because there's a reason why our souls came down, to make that dwelling place for Hashem. 
And now we'll be able to understand a phenomenal story and teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. If I said to you, have you ever been in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eden? I've never been there. Well, not that I know of. It could be my soul was there once, but consciously, here, a soul in this world to go to Gan Eden. Dana, I've never been there. Could be you have. But to read about a recent person who heard Torah's teachings in Gan Eden is awesome. We mentioned beforehand the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad Rabbi Shalom there, <clears throat> Shneerson. Astonishingly, he writes that on one Shabbos, Chai Elo, the 18th of Elo, the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe, he actually heard in Gan Eden seven teachings from the Baal Shem Tov. It's astonishing. A person in this world, a tzaddik, said that he heard from a soul that was deceased. In other words, a person who had left this world already, a soul in Gan Eden, somebody in this world, the Rebbe Rashab, who was living then, had an experience where he, hold, where he heard seven teachings from the Baal Shem Zav and wrote them down and printed them. We have them written down and in a book today. And I'm going to share with you now one of those teachings of the Baal Shem Zav based on the mitzvah of Bikurim. And it has a wonderful lesson to each one of us. I'm holding a sefer called Hayom Yom. It's a beautiful book written by the Rebbe, a diary, which there is an entry of a Hasidic aphorism for every single day of the year. Nuggets of wisdom, inspiration, and pure drops of the wellspring of Hasidic teachings, which are and stem from the crown of God. On the 18th of Elul, the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tov born in 1698 and the birth of the Alter Rebbe in 1745. <clears throat> Here the Rebbe Rashad records that in 1892, on Shabbos, Parshas the 18th of Elul, after the beginning of Shabbos, he heard the following teaching from the Baal Shem Tov. When you will come into the land, are settled. Eretz Loshen Merutza. The word Eretz comes from the word Merutza, which means running. Veloshen Rotzoin, Kidi Isa Bemedrash, and it comes from the word Rotzoin, will or desire. When you will attain that level of rotsoin, of desire for the godly, that's a gift from above and an inheritance to everyone of Israel, is the Avoida Davzain Vyoshavta then your Aveda should be, you should dwell in it. Aroptrogin in his yashvos, internalizing everything that you have attained. Velokachta, vesamta batena, bringing it into a basket. Mamshech zayn oiris drawing lights into vessels. Let me explain. 
We spoke beforehand about Bikurim, about the concept of Bikurim, of recognizing that the soul was there at the very beginning and that it was sent down here for a specific purpose. And the purpose is, I'm only created to serve my master. When you realize that you're in Eretz Yisrael, which is the land that wants to do the will of its maker. In other words, if you are living in that conceptual land, in other words, your space, whether it be in the literal land of Israel or in the diaspora, but in your head and heart, you are living in a conceptual bubble. That's what we like using today in COVID bubbles. You're living in a conceptual bubble of a place that wants to fulfill the rotsoin, eret, the rotsoin, the desire of Hashem. That's your goal. Then what you need to do is to take that level and inspiration, the samtor batena, you need to bring it into vessels, put it in baskets. You need to bring that basket and deposit it in the temple. And you should go to the place which the Almighty chooses. And here the Baal Shem says beautiful words. A Jew needs to know as at a gate from Ein Oret in them Andron, when he goes from one place to another, is neither a gate alone. He's not going by himself. Nor mefirtim melamaila. He's being led from above. Um the kavana is l'shakrin shmoisham. And what is the whole purpose? Why he is being led? To, in to create the indwelling of God's name in that place. Oif mefarsen zayim elekusin dem orot vura is. To publicize, to make known. And to manifest godliness in the place that he is. So let's just internalize that. In other words, when we come to the recognition of Bikuri, first fruits, in other words, I've got to take my first fruits, my primary energies, my main involvement in this world, and I've got to dedicate it to the service of the Almighty. What do I need to do? I need to bring it down that inspiration into vessels. And I need to go to a place. And my purpose of going to that place is not because I'm going to that place, it's because God is bringing me to that place in order to create a dwelling for God in that place. That's what the Rebbe Rashab heard from the Baal Shem Tov after Kabbalat Shabbat after the inception of Shabbos. Achar Tfilos Arvis, after Marib, Chozar Oida Pan Torah Hakidemis, the Baal Shem Tov repeated the Torah, Vahosef, and he said the following Vahoya Kisavai. And when you will come, Bichdei Dazol Sukum and Tarotzen, how do you actually get to that level of Rotzen? of being completely given over to the will of Hashem, that your persona is quite simply a manifestation of that will of Hashem. How do you get there? How do you get to that point? Is das durch dem as vahalachta alamokim l'shakin shmoisham. Zol sich moise nefesh sein oif mefrasen sein dorten alikos. It comes through Self-sacrifice, it comes through the knowledge that you need to go to that place and go out of your comfort zone in order to create an indwelling of the divine there.
However, how do you publicize godliness, says the Baal Shem by saying a blessing and saying a verse of Tehillim. Nothing earth shattering, nothing that has to go on the front page of the local papers or the New York Times. By saying a bracha, by saying some Tehillim, by simple things. What the Baal Shem was teaching us and what the purpose of this class is, is that as we're going now into the new year, with 19 days left to Rosh Hashanah, when the king is in the field in the month of Elam, we need to know the following. God has given each one of us first fruits. God has bestowed upon each one of us energies and resources we shouldn't squander. God has given us time this month of introspection of where we're to look within and reflect without. What we're supposed to do during this month is think, how is tomorrow going to be better than today? What is my decision for this coming year? How am I going to take this coming year and use all my first fruits the first fruits of my mind, my heart, my hands, my legs, my feet, my 248 limbs and 365 sinews in the fulfillment of the mitzvahs of Hashem, in that eret, in that will to do the rotsin, the desire of Hashem. How am I going to do that? Says the Baal Shem Tov. You've got to realize the following where you are, exactly where you are, whichever locale, wherever the kaleidoscope of divine <clears throat> geography has brought you, that's exactly, in that echelon, in that social circle, that's where you need to do it. You need to inspire yourself. You need to realize you are Bikurim, you have a soul, and you need to become infectious to others, not with, God forbid, an illness, but with simcha, with emuna, with joy, with faith, with vitality, chayas, and with dugma chaya, with a living example of how a Jew should conduct themselves. What a beautiful, beautiful lesson the Bikurim gives us the Onisa of Yomarto. Come and say thanks to Hashem. Thank you, Hashem, for allowing me the recognition, the understanding, the perception that I will require in this coming year to devote my primary energy and resources to the fulfillment of your will. And if you go into Rosh Hashanah with such an Ani Ladoidi, such a movement from below, you are guaranteed a beautiful Kasiba Vachasima Teva, a beautiful inscription, and being sealed in the Book of Life, in the Book of Eternity, and most important, in revealing within this world its true godly. Essence in the coming of Mashiach, the Meir of the Amen. Amen. About Duba, we look forward to offering Bikurim in the base of Mikdash Ashlishi. With the Iskalas of Mashiach, take it from Yad. Thank you for taking us on this journey. Thank Over you. to you, Aaron.